Thank you very much, Stefan. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity uh, to talk with everyone today. So without further ado, thank you for, for attending. Uh, we'll get started. Uh, so uh, the Insight Toolkit and uh, start with uh, what we're going to talk about today. The outline is going to be first give a background of the Insight Toolkit, uh, ITK and discuss what it is, what it's used for, and uh, why it's relevant to you. Uh, then we'll talk about a little bit about history, a little story about the Python wrapping history. Uh, after that, we'll start to get into some new stuff, what's new and recent and exciting and interesting. Python packages, um, developing modules and creating packages from them on GitHub. Uh, a more Pythonic interface, and NumPy bridge, and uh, Jupyter widgets. And at the end, we'll just give uh, some pointers on how to get more information and to take part in the community. So first, uh, wh what is the Insight Toolkit? It's Insight Segmentation and Registration Toolkit is the long name. A uh, longer name is the National Library of Medicine Insight Segmentation and Registration Toolkit because it was supported by uh, the National Library of Medicine for many years now. And it's uh, uh, focusing mostly on image analysis, so scientific image analysis, uh, not just your camera photos, but things that you encounter in medical imaging and microscopy, uh, satellite imagery, so some different types of images. And uh, its goals are to uh, be high performance uh, and dimensional image analysis. Mostly images, but some uh, other data structures too, algorithms for this. Uh, the analysis side of that. So this means uh, processing images, running filters on them, advanced filters and algorithms, doing registration, segmentation, uh, analyzing, and doing other things to essentially take your imaging data and get meaningful numbers or make insights into what your data means. Uh, so kind of to give a really high level overview of what's the structure of, of the library, uh, at its core, there's a set of data structures that it defines and, and processing classes. So you know, basic data structure is a data object and the basic data structure a process object. And then broad categories of uh, the functionality are Input and output, so a lot of uh, file interfaces uh, for different scientific data formats. Uh, then filtering is where a lot of the, the processing uh, functionality goes. So mapping an input to an output, this filter type idea, this engineering type idea. And then higher level algorithms are often these segmentation and registration algorithms. So segmentation, uh, if you're not familiar, and uh, are new to image analysis is, is a difficult problem. It's one of the, the harder problems, so that's kind of what is part of its name. And uh, the object of the goal of segmentation is to take some data, an image, and on each pixel apply uh, a label uh, that identifies what is uh, at, at that pixel. So here's a brain, and say we want to segment the brain, uh, and what are, where is the uh, white matter of the brain, and then we identify the white matter of the brain on the right. At segmentation, it's, it's really a, a difficult problem with machine learning. Now there's been many advances, but uh, the other kind of uh, very difficult task that has been the goal of the toolkit from the start is registration. And what is registration? Registration is where you try to find the spatial correspondence between often two images or maybe multiple images. So this could be you have a set of images that were taken over time, and you want to see uh, how the content in that, in that data structure is evolving. Uh, it could be you have multiple modalities. So you I'd image the same data structure in multiple modalities, and you want to find the correspondence there. So the objective is to find this spatial correspondence, a spatial transform. Uh, and this is something that uh, ITK does very well, uh, and a lot of the architecture of the library is based off that. And being able to handle things in space quite well, this is kind of one of the unique things about uh, the toolkit. So uh, what is there? Uh, 
and how much of it is there. So just to, kind of to give an idea here, let's go through some of the data, the numbers that, that, that describe this. Uh, so as uh, Stefan said, it's been around since uh, 1999, 2000. We had Rolf's uh, very nice present keynote this morning around this time that, that SciPy has been started. And since then, it's been growing and growing uh, over its history. Um, this is an integral here over, over time, more or less, not removing very much code, but maybe we should remove more to uh, 1.7 million lines of code. Maintaining it is difficult. Uh, so then, you know, big numbers, 47, 497 person years with a algorithm that somehow gets that result. Um, and starting, you know, almost 20 years now, uh, and we're approaching the, the huge landmark of 50,000 commits, so ideas on how to throw a party at that point are welcome. <laughs> we hit that, that point. So, you know, it's this, this huge library, um, and then maybe five years ago, it was gotten so big that it needed to be broken down to be manageable into different modules, and then the, the toolkit is built into modules based on functionality, and so there's uh, kind of, you kind of have and dependencies between, between modules, that's what's shown on the right there. Hundred thirty modules. So then uh, the I/O stuff. So you know, supporting all these different uh, image file formats uh, that are many of them your common file formats, but also a lot of scientific file formats uh, for different domains. Um, you know, TIFF, big TIFF, very large TIFFs that you encounter in microscopy, uh, DICOM, which you encounter in medical imaging. Um, Twenty-two different file formats, roughly. Uh, and then these are the different types of filtering algorithms. There's many different uh, filtering algorithms. These are just all the different classes of the filtering algorithms. There's many implementations within these different classes, but the kind of functionality is you know, computing gradients and smoothing operations and deconvolutions. And then uh, there's different types of segmentation algorithms in different categories. So here's kind of a rough idea of the different categories. There's a very nice level set implementation and. Um, N-dimensional ND, which is really cool. Uh, some watersheds, uh, connected components, label voting, uh, region growing. Uh, there are classifiers, although you know this day and age you probably would use some machine learning li library to do the classification uh, itself. Scikit-learn or one of the deep learning libraries. Uh, and then there's different types of uh, registration algorithms. Um, What's mostly used is this registration optimization framework where you have different uh, options in different categories for viewing registration, finding the spatial correspondence, uh, and viewing that as an optimization problem where you can choose a numeric optimizer. You can choose uh, your cost function, which is a, a image similarity matching metric uh, that you can choose in many different options and kind of plug all these components together uh, to get a registration algorithm that will work with your type of data. So uh, these, for these type of hard problems, right, you, we often have to create the correct algorithm for the data so it works in an automated way. So the registration optimization framework, there's also daemons, um, this kind of optical flow type, fine, uh, PDE type algorithms, and then uh, finite element method based algorithms. And uh, so there's a lot, a lot of content, I guess, is the, is the point on uh, imaging algorithms that are powerful and, and useful. But how did, we, how did we get these algorithms? Part of it is being developed over 20 years. You kind of build this up. But a lot of it is, is having a big community of, of uh, research, research software engineers contributing to the project. So uh, here's a nice, interesting visualization of uh, the the code reviews we did, and migrating to Git, and, and, and each of the nodes in this graph is a person, and the, the edges are the number of code reviews. Really need to see uh, all the activity and kind of sharing knowledge in that way. Uh, we also have here an interesting graph. There's so many commits, you can actually quantify and see 
uh, an experiment here on the on the x-axis is the number of fix-up commits. So somebody commits something and then they come back within a few days and change it again because they had a fix again. So that's defining fix-up commits. And after we started doing code review with Git, that actually can be seen to de decrease. And re this is made to be to be used by researchers in commercial applications um, for people who are teaching. So it has to work really well. So there's a, a lot of software quality, software engineering going into that nightly testing. Uh, 2,800 re regression tests, um, 88.63 code coverage. When you have that much code, you start count the hundredth digit and, and make sure you put that up there because it takes a lot of work to, to get one more um, in that case. And, and so uh, all this begs the question, right? You know, the Inside Toolkit has been used a lot in, in a lot of the research community, but I think it's been, it's been gone and absent, more or less, in the SciPy community. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. Um, and why is that? So there's a kind of a story. We can look at the, the history of Python and, and ITK. Um, so it goes back a long time. Um, circa 2002, uh, a long time ago, but somehow in the future, this is one of my colleagues who I work with, uh, Brad King, and he uh, came to my company, Kitware, and his first job was to create the Python wrapping for, for ITK. Um, this was around the time uh, or before kind of CMake, this tool for building uh, C and C++ scientific codes it was developed uh, for ITK, and he's now the maintainer of that, and that's what he does, and that's very useful for, for the open source world. But this was his first job, and uh, he did a pretty good job. He's very, very technically excellent, and uh, created the, the Python wrapping. Um, was proud of it, and justifiably. Uh, so there has been uh, some Python wrapping, uh, there's, and then there's tools built around it that are used by other projects, parsing this very complex uh, C++ code, it's written in C++. Um, but it didn't have a, a lot of adoption, uh, you know, so we, they created this wrapping, it was really a kind of a technical challenge, but um, the people who created it weren't really using it. Uh, directly, and most of the people who were developing the library were C++ developers. And so, not a huge amount of ad adoption right away with, with the library. But, um, you know, the story of Python and, and ITK, there are a lot of people who kind of saw the potential of the library and they put a huge amount of effort and, and interesting work into the project. Um, one was a, a Frenchman who came and went and rewrote all the, the Python wrapping infrastructure in Python, which was a huge effort. And some other folks go on, it went on and made some tools that are maintained and used by other projects. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other people who just did these heroic efforts in other technical areas. I don't have uh, time to mention them. Uh, we can observe, though, a pretty interesting thing, is that a lot of them are French. So I uh, love the Frenchies. I would recommend uh, rooting for France in the, in the World Cup. Go France. England's up on Croatia, so it'd be fun. Maybe, maybe France, England, so no offense to the English folks here. Uh, and so it's been used and it's been deployed in Python packages on Linux distributions with the help of folks for some adoption. Uh, but the big, the big event and what has really helped encourage adoption is last year uh, there were binary Python packages made available for the different platforms and this has kind of been a huge wonderful thing. Uh, so thanks to Mike Serhan who was just talking a little bit ago, Anthony Skolpatz and other people. Uh, JC talked about this project earlier today but that's been a big event and then hopefully now it's much easier to get started with the toolkit because we, there are these packages. And uh, these packages are available for the toolkit, but if you write your own code, there's also a cookie cutter that you can run and put your packages on, on GitHub, 
and make the CI work so this is all kind of wonderful stuff and create packages for all the different platforms. Um, this has been used a little bit already. Uh, so you can do and, and touch this idea of domain specific applications or new applications and bring them into the toolkit which is a lot of maintenance or experimental things. So it's a wonderful to, way to, to add stuff uh, like the isotropic wavelets, uh, Pablo Hernandez, uh, someone who did his PhD learning about wavelets and all that wonderful knowledge kind of is there in that module. Um, things like ultrasound reconstruction or um, other type of algorithms for specific uh, topics. So going forward, what's happening in the toolkit is that it is written in C++, and so the Python in some ways kind of reflects that C++ API, which is useful in some contexts. So uh, the, pipeline, the uh, toolkit is capable of streaming in many contexts. So you can handle very large images um, which is which is nice, um, but it results in you setting up a pipeline and then running the pipeline at the end, and this can be verbose. So the new things that are coming is a more procedural Pythonic uh, API using snake case, and you can just do it in one line, uh, which is nice. You know, kind of this goal, uh, like Ralph said in the, in the keynote this morning, of a, a nice API you can do it in one line. So that's, that's being cool, being Pythonic, which is wonderful. Um, we're getting woke to being Pythonic, being cool, I'm trying. Uh, another neat thing is the, the NumPy bridge. So, so, so working together with the rest of the Python community means working with NumPy. And so we're using this Python buffer protocol in a nice way, make images and arrays available in the toolkit available in NumPy, and then that means you can go back and forth with all the other wonderful uh, toolkits and projects out there and tools, either for image analysis or for analyzing the data that you get out afterwards, scikit-image, um, OpenCV, or the, all the wonderful machine learning libraries. So that's a powerful thing. And the other exciting thing is uh, a neat thing. We have a poster on these Jupyter widgets, which is um, very functional and in a powerful way to do the image analysis and then kind of see the effect of what's happening uh, in the toolkit. So this is using ITK, but also some web technologies, VTKJS and WebGL. And uh, yeah, it's really a powerful thing, I think. And so here's a demo showing with scikit-image and some pet data. Uh, new algorithms available in the, the most recent release of scikit-image that you can examine the data, find out what parameters in this way are appropriate for your algorithms, and then evaluate, get those parameters quickly, for example, your segmenting structures. So that's uh, kind of the summary of the talk. Here are links that you may find relevant. There's a Jupyter tutorial. There's a software guide like 800 pages written many years ago by some other folks that talks about how to do image analysis and, and in this toolkit specifically. Sphinx examples, there's a discourse discussion uh, that is a great place to talk with the community. So thanks for your time and attention. That's good.